Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burrus. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is P.J. O'Rourke, writer and political satirist, contributing editor at the Weekly Standard, H.L. Mencken Research Fellow at the Cato Institute, and author of 19 books, the newest being None of My Business. P.J. explains money, banking, debt, equity, assets, liabilities, and why he's not rich and neither are you. Welcome to Free Thoughts, P.J. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I, I, we'll get to the book, but I'd like to ask you about your first job, which in a book you have called Agent Guile, Beat Youth and Innocence and a Bad Haircut, you, you say it was at a Baltimore newspaper called Harry. Harry, H-A, in fairness, H-A-R-R-Y, although H-A-I-R-Y probably would have described <laughs> the era uh, pretty well. Yes, we had a um, uh, an underground newspaper, not that there was anything illegal about it. I mean, there was a fair amount of illegal things that we were doing while we were there. Well, one smoking pot. Which was very illegal. At the time. It I mean, very the, the, was very illegal. Uh, but uh, it, certainly nobody had tried to suppress our, 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 our free speech. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, we were, you know, against the war and in fa- against capitalism and in favor of uh, bell-bottom pants and, uh, and uh, walking into the wall because you were stoned out of your gourd. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think the only thing that really set Harry apart from a lot of the noise that was being made was that uh, uh, we continually got the giggles. We couldn't stay too serious um, about being hippies because there was something innately hilarious about hippies that even we perceived. And so it was the rare element in the new left that had some measure of a sense of humor. Would you have called yourself a socialist or something at the time, do you think? Oh, I think a Maoist. Not that I <laughs> even go even further. Had, not that I had any idea what that would mean. You know, not that I'd ever ever read a single word of Chairman Mao and to this day I haven't, I don't believe. Was the was the war the biggest political issue? Oh, you were the war was <clears throat> To understand the 60s uh, and 60s politics is really very simple. Uh, It was the 60s. We were having an absolutely great time. The birth control pill had been discovered. Um, (laughs) The the economy was going great guns. Everybody was prosperous. The cars were very cool. You know, the safety Nazis hadn't gotten in and screwed up all the cars yet. Uh, And uh, uh, and then – Marijuana had been discovered. I mean, I, even back when I was in high school, not that we could find any, but we were trying hard, and uh, we were just having an absolutely great time. It was a it was a beautiful, sunny period in American history, and uh, all of a sudden, here comes the draft and this war, and we're we're having a party, man. And they want us to they want to cut our hair off, and they want to send us to some place with noxious flora and fauna and terrible weather to shoot people that we didn't even know. Uh, uh, and what was worse, those people were expected to shoot back. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they'd want, you know, I'd been willing to cut my hair if they were wanted to send me to shoot my stepfather <laughs> drunk on the couch. But, you know, that wasn't the idea. And so it just came as such a surprise. I mean, if you listen to those if you listen to mid '60s music, you hear a really sunny landscape. You know, if you listen to Motown, if you listen to the Beatles, even the Rolling Stones, the darker uh, uh, British import. You know, it's all really very upbeat. It was really fun. It was really happy. We were having a great time, and um, along came this stupid war. And that's really all you need to understand about. It. You don't need to understand whether the war was right or whether the war was wrong or some sort of like deep political shift was going on in the United States. It wasn't. Um, It was just uh, the interruption of a party. And it goes to show you the aftermath of the 60s having been quite horrible. goes to show you how much trouble you can get in if you interrupt a party. So how did you end up at National Lampoon? Uh, You know, it was pretty – I was working in – like I said, there's this thing called Harry in Baltimore. And um, I decided I really wanted to be a – you know, some kind of writer – uh, magazine writer of some kind. And in those days, all the magazine work was done in New York. So I moved up to New York, worked on one of those underground newspapers up in the, the East Village Other, um, but all the time keeping my feelers out for a real job. And uh, not that National Lampoon looks in retrospect like a real job, but it did at the time. They actually paid money. And so, you know, I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and managed to wheedle my way in there. What was the mantra of National Lampoon? I, I mean, I have an idea. I don't think a lot, my dad has old issues and stuff. It, it hasn't been prominent for a while. But was it just humor or were you going for – Oh, no. It was just humor. It was, the idea was to 
knock and mock everything. Uh, it was absolutely uh, 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 an absolute. It was humor at its most destructive. You know? So was, was, was there a was there a political element? Was it going after the le- the right more than the left? Would you think? Well, or? we ran a uh, uh, we ran one issue called "Is Nothing Sacred" with a picture of Che Guevara on the front getting a pie in the face. So, <laughs> no, I don't think it had any particular politics. I mean, I, I think taken one by one, uh, a number of the National Lampoon writers were um, um, were pretty lefty, uh, and then there were some like myself and John Hughes who were much more libertarian or even. Borderline conservative, but no. The, the the point was just to make fun of things. Were you there? With you were there with John Hughes at the time. Oh, John Hughes. Oh, when I I took over the magazine at the uh, end of seventy seven, and uh, John and I had been working together on a variety of projects, and he became my my yeah. John Hughes once worked for me. You know, he wrote a this isn't the movie Vacation based off of a piece he wrote for that exactly my summer vacation 1955 yeah. or something like and there's that. there were a number of things you know that that, that he worked on in um, uh, at the national lampoon that would show up in one form or another in, in his movies later on he and i did a, a sunday newspaper parody back when sunday news sunday local newspapers were still a big deal and um the dacron dacron ohio the Dacron Republican Democrat. There, you know, there had been two papers in the town, but they couldn't quite support it, so they merged. And um, uh, John and I wrote a lot of that, uh, and um, and John did a terrific job. And that was uh, a little bit of the genesis of the world that he created uh, with his uh, uh, his teenage, you know, his teenage Breakfast comedy. Club, Breakfast and Club, Fair, exactly, Fair Steelers, yeah. and Pretty in Pink, and Sixteen Candles. She described among the people writing at National Lampoon, you would have been at least nominally libertarian in your views. So I guess the question is, how did you get from the Maoist days of Harry's to, I guess, now being the H. L. Mencken fellow yeah. at Cato? Because that's yeah. that's quite a shift in perspective. Well, you know, it was it became clear uh, as the '60s went along. That the um, uh, <clears throat> that the new left was an angry, authoritarian, destructive influence, and I think one of the things that really shook me was the um, beginning of the Weather Underground, where they started bombing, uh, uh, people killing. You know, this didn't peace, love, and understanding did not seem to be you know part of the uh, of the equation uh, uh, with you know the, the more radical left. Uh, also, partly getting a job. You know, it was very simple. Uh, when I got a job, uh, I first got a job in New York. It was actually my actual first job in New York. Was I was a messenger uh, for a weekly newspaper, and um, I was paid. Uh, uh, I think I was making um, seventy-five dollars a week, and we got paid every two weeks. So I'm really looking forward to that one hundred and fifty bucks. And I net out at like eighty-six. 50 after all the taxes and I go, wait a minute, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a communist, you know, and I, somebody just like took all my money. I'm not Rockefeller, you know. So that was a, a, an eye-opener. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a very gradual process for me I and mean, it, it, it start as the left got more violent, um, I began to drift away from that. And as I saw the lives of my hippie friends kind of coming to nothing or Coming a cropper, and I just saw the fallout from the the um, uh, <clears throat> the sixties were great on two thirds of the libertarian idea, uh, individual liberty for sure, individual dignity pretty good on, individual responsibility uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Didn't work out that way. Didn't work out. But it's interesting with the violence of the left because in your new book in, in the last chapter, I think you have this part about. Uh, antifas. And, yes. And then you, you say, I, I, then I realized I was one of them or had been or had tried to be. Uh, there was a time. So you, so that violence on the left, I mean, it, it was, as you pointed out, the weather underground in the stuff in the late 60s, early 70s, but it seems like it's back. Does it look familiar to you? Yes, it totally does. Uh, although, you know, as usual with these things, they, they, they come around first as uh, history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as comedy. And so the the Antifas, uh, 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 you know, they don't seem to be having as much fun as we were, um, but but they do fall into that same category of the impulse to violence is like lots of fun at a distance and in theory, 
and everybody feels violent impulses. But when it's actually put into practice, whether it's put into practice with weather underground bombings uh, uh, or, or, or Antifa demonstrations or school shootings for that matter, all of a sudden, uh-oh, you know, this is real. This people actually get hurt from this, you know, people I might care about, people like people such as myself, <laughs> you, know, it, 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 you know, once once the reality takes shape, sensible people start to back away. I've always felt with the, with the, you know, the school shootings is that no sensitive kid goes all the way through school without some thought of blowing up the building. Uh, you know, it's like, it's maybe a horrible thing to say, you know, but you don't put that thought into action, you know. So coming out of, I mean, working as a humorist and and coming out of this tradition of humorous publications, maybe you can shed light on one of the things that's always wondered about. Which is you look at the you look at the state of comedy today, or even even art in general, um, and it seems like we're with obvious exceptions, most of the good stuff is on the left or comes from the left. Right, that that when that right wing, self consciously right wing comedians tend are, are frequently fairly cringeworthy or yeah. self consciously right or right of center yeah. movies or books are equally cringeworthy, and the good work's being done on the left. Is there is there something about the left that's doing that, or is no. there some reason? No, there's something about show business that does this. Uh, the the show business and left wing politics are always going to have an affinity for each other because it's essentially a crowd pleasing idea. Um, the first inf- mission of any entertainer is to please his or her audience, and uh, one of the things that one of the ways that you can please that audience is to reassure the audience that. Whatever's going on out there in the world that they don't like is not their fault, that they are special. And then you want that whole sort of lovey-dovey uh, – there used to be a phrase in England, lovies for labor. Uh, you want that sort of lovey-dovey thing where you say, oh, we're all in this together. Everybody is equal. You know, we're, we, we're all uh, – and we're all victims of some nastiness. You know, And if you try and be – um, uh, uh, a right-wing entertainer, you stand up. You, you end up standing there saying to the audiences, uh, it, "It's your fault." Uh, a line I've been using for years about education is, uh, "Show me the politician who's got the nerve to stand up and say no." I can't fix public education. The problem isn't uh, funding. The problem isn't overcrowding in the classrooms. The problem isn't teachers' unions. The problem isn't lack of school choice or lack of computer equipment in the classroom. The problem is your damn kids. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so you know, if you're going up to be um, uh, an entertainer, and you don't want to be telling the audience that the it's the audience's problem. So there, there's always this collectivist side to to an entertainment vo- venue that leads it in a kind of naturally leftist. Uh, there are plenty of conservative um, comedians, but it's not evident in in in, in their uh, in their stuff. I would say Jerry Seinfeld is very conservative. He doesn't talk about politics that way. It's just that you know. Jerry belongs to an observational kind of comedy that says, you know, if it's new, it's probably wrong because <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been tried, you know, <laughs> and it's like, or somebody's probably tried it before and decided it stank. You know? So after National Lampoon, you went to Rolling Stone, uh, and was that was that the immediate shift there? No, there was a, there were a couple of years where I flopped around uh, trying to figure out what to do, but uh, somebody, uh, uh, Michael Kinsley, founder of Slate. Uh, was then uh, editor of Harper's, and he sent me to the Soviet Union, and I thought, boy, this is great. This is what I want to do. I want to be a foreign correspondent. And then I got back, and Michael had gotten fired from Harper's, and so I was spent a couple of years trying to flop around, trying to figure out who I could get to send me to do this stuff. And it was finally, it was Rolling Stone. And it was said, okay, we'll do it. You know, we'll, we'll send you to cover this. And you, you talk about in the new book a little bit. I mean, you had a book, All the Trouble, Trouble in the World. Yeah. Before, where you talk about more of it, where you went to some seriously dangerous places. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they, 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 it, it wasn't safe as houses. Um, yes, actually, I, I, I retell some stories in this None of My Business book. Um, 
uh, I, I retell uh, some stories that are in earlier books, uh, of, notably of uh, uh, of covering uh, Somalia, the Civil War in in, in Lebanon, um, the kind of social collapse in in, in Albania and, uh, as a result of the pyramid uh, schemes. <clears throat> but this time, I'm doing it to, to to show economic points. Originally, I've been you know covering news or uh, uh, writing about politics. But, but all of this, there's a little economic education in, in, in all of this. So I retold some of the stories, you know, asking the readers, you know, if there's somebody who'd read this before, to, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but um, telling, the, telling some of these tales from an economic point of view. Yeah, the market in Mogadishu. Uh, was that the craziest place you think you went to when you were? Uh, I think that, uh, that Somalia was just about the pits. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was flat out the craziest place, but it certainly was the abs- most chaotic. Um, yeah, and probably the most dangerous. It was more uh, uh, civil disturbance, especially when it's very violent civil disturbance. The way it was in Somalia is much more dangerous than war. I mean, war has a direction. War has an internal logic to it. The, uh, the 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 murderous clan infighting in Somalia was there. Doubtless, there was some logic in it, but it was not uh, uh, discernible by the um, um, not discernible by the by the outsider. What do you think of the state of journalism today? Oh, it's pretty lousy. Um, it, it, journalists, um, you know, journalism used to be a trade. I mean, I'm old enough that when I started out on. Uh, uh, I worked on a weekly newspaper, not an underground newspaper, a regular weekly newspaper in uh, in, in in New York in 1970, 71, and uh, and I was you know around the daily newspaper journalists and so on. It was it was a blue collar trade. It used to be, say, you grew up in a, a poor Irish neighborhood and you 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 liked to read and you didn't want to get up early in the morning and lift heavy things. Well, you basically had two choices. You could go into the church or you could become a newspaper reporter. So, you know, you'd debate with yourself whether it be whiskey and women or just whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and, and, and so it was a craft and, and it was basically – H.L. Mencken describes it very well in his newspaper days. You just got a front row seat at everything happening in the world. And the reporter didn't feel that it was incumbent upon him as a – of course, it mostly was him – him as a reporter to judge everything. You know, that would be for the sob sisters. That's for the ed- junk on the editorial page. He would just, hey, there's a terrible traffic accident. You can't go see the traffic accident because the police have yellow tapes around, but I can go on the other side of the yellow tapes and I'll come back and tell you, whoa, that was a bad traffic accident. You know, I don't have to like lecture you about you should wear your seatbelt and, you know, and so on and so forth. That's, I'm, I'm just telling you about the traffic accident. And then along came the world savers. I, I, I blame it on uh, Woodward and Bernstein. Um, I'm good friends with Carl, but I'm still going to blame it on him. It was, uh, it was uh, all the president's men. It, it, all of a sudden, journalism saved the world. Well, get out of here. Journalism doesn't save the world. It just tells you what happened. It's up to you to save the world. And all sorts of people who should have joined the Peace Corps um, decided to become journalists instead. And not only that, but they went to journalism school, whatever that may be. You know, I mean, what they teach you in journalism school: keep your eyes open. <laughs> you know, what I mean? um, so yeah, uh, I think that's my sort of despair about it. it's. It's become one of those pious do-goody sort of professions that we really don't need any more of. Do you think that that save the worldness with the Trump administration has gotten worse? Oh sure, you know. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, this has been coming for a long time. But uh, when you get somebody as, uh, you know, f- frankly inexplicable, I- I deplorable, and ridiculous a- a- as the president of the United States, um, uh, and-, and you mix that in with a bunch of do-goody uh, uh, journalists, you're going to get just endless, endless. I mean, if H. L. Mencken were around today, he'd be enormously amused, and I'm enormously amused. Uh, but Everybody else is, seems to be furiously angry. Uh, I think it's a pretty good show, but you know, I would warn journalists against covering it too much, um, paying too much attention to Trump. 
Trump's a big toddler. He wants all the attention. He wants all the oxygen in the room. And by golly, he's been getting it. You know, there's just been no space for anybody else. I mean, he makes for good TV. He does. It's, you know, it's hilarious. And of course, what makes for good TV always makes for bad life. <laughs> say, that's a good that's a good little we should tweet mm. that one out yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of your new book covers changes in the world I think is a yeah. good things that are yeah. have changed rapidly in different ways and, and you touch on some points that you make it you touch on a lot of your work which one of them is is that baby boomers are the worst um, and now and now we have the millennials which you have two millennial daughters that you, you I do write about. Yeah. Um, so First of all, why did how did baby boomers ruin, ruin the world? My dad has said this for years too. He's uh, he's your age, yeah. and uh, he has said that he's like, we're we're the worst generation ever. Um, I like my parents, uh, like I like you, but what, what, what's wrong with your generation? Spoiled rotten is what, <clears throat> what it came to. I mean, between luck and intent, um, a whole bunch of guys came back from a great big war, a great great big really horrible war. Uh, determined uh, to uh, have a better life um, and give a better life to their kids and um, and also determined to work hard and be prosperous. Uh, they created an extremely prosperous and stable world after decades of instability because really the, the teens were, were unstable, unstable uh, 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 because of World War I, the 20s because of social change, the 30s because of the Great Depression, the 40s because of World War II. They were determined to have a stable world. So they created a stable, closeted, closeted world in which a bunch of kids were brought up with much higher standard of living than it had been, you know, higher median standard of living than had ever been experienced by any other generation. Uh, we were spoiled. Um, uh, we, we, we felt entitled. Uh, we were protected on every front. And uh, when we came up against our first major crisis, which was the war in Vietnam, uh, all the intellectuals took our side. You know, I mean, uh, uh, it was it was it was a tough period, but uh, all 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 the grown ups, all the serious grown ups, uh, were also saying, "Oh, how terrible this war is too." So we just like grew up feeling that that everything was our right, and we were right about everything. And uh, yeah, uh, does that make for um, uh, a good society? No. So then, what's wrong with the millennials? Yeah, what's wrong with the millennials? Um, <laughs> what's wrong with the millennials? I think that the the, that the millennials are just uh, have a their their mind is fogged and not without reason by such incredibly rapid changes in the economy, the technology, and the sort of social interactions as determined by that economy. Uh, I think millennials are deeply confused, but I cannot blame them a bit for they they they've grown up in a. a in a deeply confusing situation, and actually, they would. They're, they're, the fact that they're confused shows that they're not insane. You know, if they weren't confused, if they were certain about stuff, um, they'd be nuts. So I appreciate the attacks on both of the book-ending generations of my own, which is obviously Gen X is the greatest generation. Um, but so looking looking forward, then, as the these problems that you've identified, both the boomers and then with with the millennials, do you think? Do you think that we can we can dig our way out of that culturally? Do you see things potentially getting better with whatever is it Gen Z now and whoever comes after that? Oh sure. I mean, we'll age out of the boomer problem. <laughs> you know, the actuarial statistics will take care of the boomer problem. You know, and um, uh, it's going to take a while because the boomers are very fussy about their health. You know, and they probably will stick around for whew, a lot longer than the greatest generation did. And they stuck around for a while. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm assuming that if we manage to maintain um, our values as a free society, uh, that we'll sort out uh, the um, social and economic transitions. It's not to be forgotten the last time we had a major economic transition, a, a, a transition as important as uh, the transition to sort of the digital economy or whatever you want to call it, uh, was the Industrial Revolution and that there were tremendous dislocations in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, not for nothing do we have all those Thomas Hardy novels. And, and, and it's, uh, um, 
the um, and all the, the Blake's dark satanic mills and so on. It, it caused a uh, uh, it caused people to move in from rural areas all over the world, concentrate on cities. It destroyed families. It put religion in in, in, in jeopardy. And uh, you know, we just begin to sort out. We had just be, we're beginning to sort out the after effects of the of the of the industrial revolution and make and and get them so that they harness them so that they benefited everyone. When along comes a digital revolution, we <laughs> start over again. But you know, we'll be okay in, in the, you know um, in the long run. Although you know, as John Maynard Keynes said, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> I like you point out in the book that. You ask your daughter, what do you think of the digital economy? And she's like, you just mean the economy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's like it, there's something funny that he about even. Yeah, <laughs> right. And if you, said it, if you said, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, what do you think of the industrial economy? To, yeah, to people, people are, like, you mean just the economy, the yeah, regular, yeah, the regular yeah, economy? Yeah. You do say, though, that yeah, I think it's your younger daughter who, who comes to you and complains about – too much politics on her social media that she like wants to shut it off. Yeah, yeah. Did that surprise you? No, no. I, I, I can see how that would be annoying. I mean, we we fancied ourselves. Do you do social media or no? no. Okay, no. Uh, we fancied <laughs> ourselves to be very politically alert and aware back in the uh, 1960s, but uh, uh, as I recall, uh, and, you know, starting not not just the hippie 1960s, but back in the you know civil rights era um, uh, 1960s too. Uh, but a little bit of it went a long way, you know, when you're a kid because you've got more important things on your mind like, you know, where to get pot and beer and where to meet girls or boys or whatever it is you want to meet. You know? Well, you write that someday you think that we'll look back on the personal electronic communication fad with as much bafflement as we look back on the hula hoop. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Is, yeah. Do you think that we'll, we'll be – We'll be doing this, looking at our phones less uh, in uh, ten years or twenty years than we do I now. Would, I would assume the novelty factor alone will have worn. People will start to realize just how exhausting it is to be constantly connected to everybody else. You know how like how like in a, being in a noisy room it is. I mean, kids didn't ever figure that out with like the telephone. <laughs> I mean, they didn't stop calling each other all the time until they got Twitter. No, but then the telephone was self-limiting to a certain extent. You know, I mean, telephones when they were wired into the walls were so. Yeah, we used them a lot, but you could only use them so much. Before your mom got mad at you, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because there's usually only one line in the house. You know, so. now last your last book was uh, how the hell did this happen? Right, trying to explain the 2016 election. Um, is anything? Have you? Learned anything more since you wrote that book about what no. got that weird, <laughs> no. or, or is anything about Trump uh, been different than what you expected? Is it better? Is it worse? Uh, I would say it's a little better in the sense that, um, uh, well, not not better, right? But but in the sense that uh, um, America does have a lot of keel, and it is not um, uh, easy. Um, to disrupt the general course of of, of of America, even though it may be headed the wrong way, and sometimes it's not not easy to turn it around. So I think that the uh, Trump presidency, you know, for all of his uh, scary volatility and infantile behavior and so on, um, touch wood, the 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 outcomes have not been as frightening as I might have worried that they would be. Um, as someone but, who, you know, it could get worse. <laughs> now, since you you we started with the '60s and and your role your role your life at that time uh, on the anti-war left, and that's often cited as the most divided time of this country until now. Uh, does it seem Does it seem that way? Does it Does now start to seem like the '60s in some way to you? Does it seem better or worse? Uh, or, I don't think it's quite as bad. I would say actually the '60s were, were, the, 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 that period was worse division in American um, society than we've got now. The, the causes of division, the fault lines were, were, were somewhat different, uh, but there was an enormous amount of anger. I mean, our cities aren't on fire. Uh, the 60s we have better building away. codes now. <laughs> that could be it. That could very they well be They have sprinkler systems, yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is that uh, a lot of our poverty has been dispersed to old suburbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they're a little harder to burn down. I'll only go one house at a time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I would say the 60s was a really, really nasty period. Um, um, you know, the 
latter half of the, of the decade. I just said how sunny and wonderful it was. But when it comes to divisiveness in America, it was much more violent. When people talk about the, the Civil War, which, which keeps well, coming up, yeah. you know, that, that things are so divided now that we, we might yeah, have Well, consider Civil the War. real Civil War. I mean, you know, this, you know, if you want to look at division in America, division, incidentally, we survived in 1861. I mean, I'm not seeing any Well, 500,000 people didn't. Well, there's that. Yeah, yeah. No, the price, was, the price was high. But the nation, the Union did survive. No, I don't think. I mean, I, it's an unpleasant period of divisiveness, but I don't think it's terminal, fatal. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.